So today we're going to spend a little time in platform administration, talk about, you know, at a high level, generically, what is this thing for? Talk about a few new features. And we're actually going to start with some really basic fundamental stuff. Um, many of you that have been doing this for a while get it, understand it. Those that are fairly new to it, just to add a little bit of color, spark some thoughts, some questions um, on it, we'll talk a little bit about user management. Um, so within the platform, we have the ability to build functional groups. Just think of those as containers into which we can plop users, groups of users into them. And then we have the individual users themselves. Um, so functional groups, you can make as many as you want. The application by default comes with one, and it is the only user group that is managed by the system, and that is the administrator. We strongly recommend that there is one or two people at an organization that are going to be truly administering the platform. Those are the only ones that should have this. You may have local administrators that have access to the same things as the administrators or almost everything. Generally speaking, it would be pretty much everything except maybe users, except maybe permissions. So out of the gate, the very first thing I would do is create a local administrator account into which you can pop those people that are doing either everything or almost everything. Um, but understanding that as new features come online, as new things are added to the platform, if you want to extend those features to those functional groups, you actually have to come in and turn those things on for them. With the, the administrator group, the default administrator group, that happens automatically. We do an update and the administrator count, account, when it's done, has access to everything in the platform so that they can turn things on and off for other folks. So that administrator account, there is no permit, there are no permissions for you to set on that account. You can't turn things off for them. So you, you certainly want to create a local administrator and then as, as many other functional groups as you want. And functional groups allow you to do multiple things. I may have some groups that I only want them to see certain modules within the application. So I may have space planners and I'm going to allow them into the space module. I may allow them into the move module. I may allow them into Finder, whatever, but I don't let them go into a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, I may have one general group, my default group. Let's just call it my new users group where, geez, I decide that I'm going to deploy this in my organization and I want every single person in my organization to be able to submit a service request and to be able to find somebody. So I have requester, I have finder, I create a default user group, and then I allow uh, them to only hit requester and finder, and that's all they can do. Because you do have the ability within the system to turn on, uh, this is in your configuration file on the web, to say, I want people to, to, I want to turn on the join now feature. The join now feature, and there are configuration settings to it, allow people to go up to the site, geez, I'm not a user on here, I'm going to give you my name, I'm going to create a password, and when I come in, I can do, you can set the system to, up to do one of several things. They sign up, and by default, their account is suspended until you, the administrator, go in and say, okay, I'm going to accept this person, and I'm going to assign them to this functional group. You could do it manually that way. Or, you can have it set up in such a way that the person signs in, they are automatically assigned to a default user group and instantly have access to the ability to create service requests, the ability to go find somebody. So you have those abilities within the platform to do that for, for uh, functional groups. And then you have your individual users where you can import those in, set it up with data broker in your HR system, uh, their HR system. There's many ways to integrate with the application. And let's just go in here and um, let's go to a functional group for a minute and we're going to create a new one. I'm just going to call it test group. And you can give it a description if you want to. What does disable desktop mean? Disable desktop means 
hey, you know, I've given this functional group permissions to uh, requester only, and there's nothing else on the menu for them to go to, so I just want to hide the menu. So you would hit disable desktop, and then essentially what happens is it opens up to that one module that you've given them access to, and there's no ability for They couldn't navigate anyway, but even that menu on the left-hand side is gone. So it looks like a single-page application, if you will. That's what Disable Desktop does. Um, so you can make any module look like a self-contained application for a specific user group. So we're going to create this um, test group, and let's go create a new user. And I'm going to do a new user. All right, so we now have, not, have a new user and a new user group. Um, we're going to go into um, permissions and set up what this functional group can see. So I'm going to come into my list. I'm going to go find that test group, and it brings out everything in the application that I can start checking boxes. Um, I want them to see dashboards. And if I expand this, I can. there's only one thing under there. But uh, let's say we want them to see drawings. And we want them to see the drawing viewer. Um, we don't want them to be able to do anything with moves. They're not an administrator. They're not going to link records. We're going to let them see attributes and layers and objects. We don't want them doing theming. We don't want them doing plan views. Uh, they can't edit any records. They can only view it. Oh. Um, we don't want them opening up the raw DWF file. We're not giving them access to reports. They can't edit anything in the drawing. Uh, they can't manage labels. They can't create a service request. They can't create a work order. They can't create a move in or a move out order. These are basically viewer only drawings or, or people that can only view drawings. Um, so that's what we've done. We've just pretty much set them up so that they can see a dashboard and they can see drawings and that's all there is to it. We can then go down to individual dialogues. So we have given them access to drawings whereby they would be seeing space records, they would be seeing asset records. So we're going to go to dialogues and we're going to select that functional group. And we're going to say on the asset dialogue, and I still haven't done this, forgive me, on changing this out. Um, so we're going to go to the asset dialog. Come on, wake up. And we're going to go to tools, and um, we can decide that we don't want them creating service requests from the asset dialog. Uh, we are going to let them open location drawings. We're going to go to the individual tabs, and we're basically going to decide that they can only do read-only. They cannot edit anything. And furthermore, for this particular group, PM schedules are irrelevant to them. Materials are irrelevant to them. We're not doing dependencies and, and services. We don't want to show them work orders. Documents are unimportant. Uh, we want them to be able to see basic core space information, allocation, contacts, pictures, comments. We don't even want them doing comments. Um, and then the detailed information. Then we can get down into the individual fields uh, where we can start deciding what they can and can't see. We're going to hide life cycle and disposal. Well, we'll do disposal date, but we're not doing any numbers uh, in there. So we're not going to do any replacement costs. Um, we don't want them even seeing the serial number. License is irrelevant. The location detail is irrelevant. Essentially, you get to turn on and off anything you want. What I'm about to talk about is a key factor on attributes. So we're under assets right now, and as you can see, the asset ID is a required field. We talked a little bit about this last week. Required fields are applied to everything. So it's even though I'm configuring this functional group as to what they can see and what they can edit, required fields get applied universally, meaning I may want a combination field. So I have an organization where the asset ID may be unique between properties. So I want to be able to create a fire extinguisher 001 on property A and a fire extinguisher 001 on property B 
That being the case, I would want my required fields to be asset ID and property at a bare minimum. And that is going to make sure that every time I add new records, whether I'm importing them, whether I'm creating them individually, that I have just set a combination key uh, for this particular collection. Now, once I get beyond some of these um, truly unique things, property, building, floor, space, asset name, asset ID, I can make other fields required, but they're not going to be applied to the key. It just I, A user will not be able to save a record till they put a value in, but it's not going to be applied to the key. Um, and we'll, we can talk more, and maybe we'll do more in depth on what the keys look like. So this is how I configure individual dialogues, what the users in that group get to see or do within those dialogues. And then we'll go down to grids, and it's essentially the same thing. And this is this is where we can do um, handle the situation we were just looking at. Let's do this test group. Let's assume for a minute that this was our um, uh, our functional group, folks. And actually, I don't even know if that grid is in here now. I may have to and I may have to add that here. Uh, but let's go back to assets and talk about this individual group. Here's all of the columns that are available on that particular grid. And once again, we've decided we don't want them to see uh, some things in here, uh, anything related to costs we want to hide from them, uh, and whatever else we want to do in here. Um, life cycle, whatever. Location is unimportant. Um, they are not going to be able to see those columns in a grid from now on. So you have some pretty tight control over what people within user groups can see and what people within user groups can do. We're looking at some additional capabilities for future releases, um, but for the current release and the pending release, this is pretty much what you can do for users. The auto load checkbox is for huge clients. Ohio State University is managing upwards of 40 million square feet right now in a single database. And we can talk about bigger deployments later, and, and we have recommendations for better ways to do you know, multinational deployments um, where you, you can do things more effectively. So Ohio State University literally has multiple millions of records in the database. And there are a handful of grids that can be slow. I have huge collections, and it's taking 10 to 15 seconds for a grid to load. Our users get frustrated because the, the grid loads, then they have to actually apply the search that they want to do. By default, we're auto-loading all the grids. But you can take auto-load off. So let's do that. Let's take auto-load off. With auto-load off, this is what happens when you come to a grid. It automatically opens up the filter section. It tells you you need to apply filters or search for records to display the records. And then until you actually add a search or a filter, uh, you see nothing. I don't know what I have in here. But the minute you do apply things, you're going to start seeing those records. So that's what the auto load feature will do. Let's just kind of now take this at platform admin at the, at the, the highest level. What is platform admin? It is where you to go to set up those standards, those internal things that you want to force um, data consistency across um, your your um, deployment. So you're you're setting up classifications. What are those things? You're setting setting up um, different default values that become available uh, in drop downs and uh, across things. Um, Go to the platform level for a moment. Um, stored procedures, for those of you that we provide some stored procedures in here, these are at the administrative level. It allows you, hey, I have a customer who uniquely wants to do something special periodically. It's We're not going to make it a function. We're not going to make it a module. But they want the ability to be able to run a stored procedure that does something that's special to them or something that has a benefit to users, we have what we call user-defined stored procedures, where <clears throat> you create a stored procedure, we're going to validate that stored procedure before it's put in, 
because it affects the platform. And then if it works, we can put the stored procedure in and make it accessible to individual users if they want to so that they can run those stored procedures. Um, we've talked about permissions. We've talked about organization um, allocation settings. This is when people move in and out, um, how am I actually going to allocate my spaces? Um, in big organizations, very often they are allocating by occupant. I want my space automatically assigned to the department that belongs to the occupant whose ass I put in that seat. That's how most organizations want to do it. And that being said, we have some very large organizations that want to do everything manually. Just based on these check boxes or radio options, you get to pick how your system is going to function. And there are overrides on individual records should you want to do that. Organization structure is your five-tier hierarchy. Cost center, well, this would actually be tier one through five if I had no aliases here. Tier one is the, is the account that gets assigned at the space level and then everything else is a roll up. So my cost centers roll up to departments. So I may have one department that has five cost centers. Um, under my divisions, I may roll up division, uh, uh, departments to divisions, and once again, you're just setting up the hierarchical um, uh, organization for a particular um, group so that they can now start doing allocations and, and understand who owns what spaces. By default, these names would be Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 4, Tier 5. I've gone in and changed aliases to give them names that meet my organization taxonomy. And maintenance, lots of bells and whistles in here. We're not going to go uh, into any real detail on here, but this is, once again, this is where you set up your standards. You define what values I'm going to see, how is this thing going to function. We will do um, a deeper dive into maintenance because it's its own beast, particularly around jobs. Let me just say to you, the real magic in maintenance the real magic in having things, the real magic in automation within maintenance comes at this one level right here, the job level, if you will. We'll talk about that in detail in another session. Um, so once again, you, you set up all your stuff, and then as far as drawing imports and drawing management, that's all done under here. But let's talk about one last thing before we wrap this up, and that's a feature that is new to this coming release, and it's called administrative grids. Um, this is going to uh, continue to grow and change and morph over time. But it is a placeholder for us to provide some other functions that may not really, might not belong anywhere else, um, and a place where uh, I have one here and it's not, it's, it's not going to display because there's certain user-defined fields. So we have one customer who wanted some very specific, hey, I need a grid that brings all this crap together for me that I can export that I can then, this is actually for a large healthcare system, that I can then send out um, for Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement. And how they do it is very unique to what they do. So instead of going into some giant customization, I can create a grid that's specific to them, place it in here under administrative grids, where the only things they can do in this particular grid is export the data. We're, we're taking our time as to what user interactions are going to be available at these different levels. So once you start playing with it, you're going to, you're going to hear, hey, we want to be able to delete this. We want to be able to edit this. Let us know, and we'll start to evaluate those things. Um, so you're not going to see this one here, but here's what you're going to see, and here is one functional grid. We are providing the ability to bump users out if you want to. Once again, this is at the administrative level. Uh, most organizations don't care. They're never going to be actually working with it. Um, oh, I do have to change numbers here. So this user has been in the system for 45 minutes. This user has been in the system for 15 minutes. Geez, I'm a stingy organization. I only bought three licenses and have 10 people working and I now have people getting messages that they can't get on, and I happen to know that this user is on vacation right now, so I can select the user. And by the way, they get 
bumped out after some period of time anyway um, when a user comes in. I can simply remove that. We're not removing the user. We're closing their session and freeing the license. So I hit that, and there we go. So that user has been bumped out. Doesn't stop them from coming back in, but now they're just they're not consuming a license right now. If they were to log back in, they would consume a license again. And uh, so I can do this. If I bump out the administrator, you're just going to see these right back in again, because I am. So that's that's a feature where you do have some functionality. Very simple, very straightforward. Let you know who's in the system from a user level. Uh, when when their status was last updated, how many days, hours, and minutes have they been in the system? Um, we have some simple allocation grids. Once again, main benefit, there's no real user interaction with these other than exporting the list. So, geez, I want to create... Um, I have a customer that has very specific needs, and they want to create a grid that's very unique to them, and can't be kind of recreated from any of the core stuff that's in here. We, we now have a place to put that. You folks can do those individually for your customers. It's very simple. Create your, your grid, create your underlying view, and then you're adding an entry to a single table and it'll display here, or we can do it for you, which we're doing for many folks. Um, but there's some ways of looking at data that's difficult in, in, in any other method. Um, download history is another one. Anytime uh, users download a picture, a document from the platform, you're going to be able to see that entire download history here. What module were they in when they downloaded it? What date was it downloaded? Who downloaded it? What did they download? Um, that's in here for you to look at if you want. Um, inactive. Uh, records. These are those records, and of course, I'm in my demo database here or my, my development database, so some of this stuff is going to be ugly. These are records that do not show up under, so I'm in inactive buildings. I have at some point within Evolve on the buildings grid, I've deleted these records for whatever reason. Most times it's legitimate reasons. That doesn't exist. It's invalid, I made a mistake, I'm going to recreate it, whatever. This just gives you a list of these. Right now, there's no action to be taken other than exporting the list. We may have the ability in the future to delete them, but we also have to look at what effects those may have. And why didn't you automatically put up there the ability to delete them? Because we have to find methods of educating the users that, geez, I used to have this building, I retired that building last month. We sold it. We leased it to somebody else, so we're not managing it anymore in the system. But I may have a crap load of history that goes along with that thing, including work orders and vendors and costs and allocations and assignments and all that stuff that I may need. So we're not providing the ability to delete right now because until we find very comfortable ways of notifying the user what the impact of deleting that thing is. Uh, we don't want to make it happen. But at least you can see what those records are. And if there's some problem, some goofiness, um, you at least have an, a sense of what may or may not have happened. 